cutting-edge ideas to form daily. The technology of construction must therefore evolve. At Bluescope, we are at the forefront of innovation. We develop steel not only to serve as material, but also as a source of inspiration, helping to fuel the creativity of architects looking to build the latest modern architectural marvels. Bluescope's innovative lightweight steel has allowed architectural forms to become increasingly organic. Our flat, curved and tapered steel panels reveal a new world of possibilities for freeform architecture. Once freed from the limitations of traditional materials, buildings can now be crafted precisely according to aspired values and aesthetics. Every building has the potential to become one of the world's iconic designs. Innovations in coated steel have helped improve its utility and beauty in all types of designs, from buildings to home appliances. Bluescope's innovations have transformed steel into a primary material suitable for all types of design and construction projects. Even houses can now be included as our innovative structural steel can be used anywhere from the roof, walls to the floor and is durable in all weather conditions. Building houses has never been this easy, convenient or quick and standards have never been higher. Bluescope will never stop developing and innovating. We want to push boundaries and help transform a great design into an architectural masterpiece recognized around the world. With our networks in Australia, America and Asia. Bluescope has become a world leader in innovation and the production of coated steel and pre-painted steel. We are advancing the construction and design industries and improving the standard of living for people of all classes. We manufacture the highest quality cold roll steel. Coated steel and pre painted steel of beauty and unmatched durability. Blue Scope has also set new safety standards in the construction industry. Our system, processes, and equipment during installation put the safety of workers first. Going beyond the limits of imagination will no longer be just a dream if we have innovations that can make it a reality. Blue Scope will work with architects and designers to support and inspire each other with the goal of advancing the worlds of construction and architecture together.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, Ajahn Pacharin. Good afternoon, Ajahn Hansa. Welcome you all back to ASA International Forum 2017. Our last speaker is Mr. Shinko Masuda, the co-founder of Shinko Masuda Katsuhisa Osubo Architects. The firm is found in 2007. They quickly gained recognition and numerous prizes including their prestigious Emerging Architecture Award. Their yeah. most famous project to date is Boundary Window in Tokyo, involving the conversion of an average two-story house into a photographic studio. The finished building stands out from its suburban context due to the supersized glass curtain wall affixed to the front of the building. Now please welcome Mr. Shinko Masuda. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much uh, to Asa and uh, all of my great Thai friends uh, who are supporting me all the time, and, um, and my wife, thank you. And well, first of all, I would like to introduce my office. Uh, I'm actually uh, working with my partner, uh, a friend from high school, I, will, I know him really well. Uh, his name is Katsuhisa. And um, it's not working maybe? Oh, okay. So this is Katsuhisa, and uh, this was taken for a magazine, it's a, po a portrait, and uh, my friends, my architect friends in Japan, they always uh, have fun of us that he's like a sniper, and uh, I'm like the commander, like telling him to kill somebody, and well, he's a very nice guy. He's, uh, he's quiet, uh, but uh, he's a really nice guy. He's a good designer. And well, we run office from 2007, which is uh, the year we graduated from university. And well, so 2007 was not like opened an office. We, we, we were just graduated. And gradually, we just became an office. That's, the, uh, that's our uh, office history. And before uh, reconsidering dwelling, uh, this ASA forum theme. Um, I think it is very important to think about uh, richness, what the, the word we like. Um, this is what we're saying from the beginning. Uh, richness uh, meaning that uh, of course, it's not about the money. Um, like when you say richness of nature or richness of life, um, it's not something always positive. Uh, it contains uh, negative things, uh, up and down, um, huge to small. Um, I think that depth of what it has and uh, the width of what it has um, is important uh, to call something rich. Uh, and designing uh, something, we want some richness into it. And it's very difficult to um, design richness. Uh, I think it should be very, it, the richness is very complicated, I think. Uh, the na for instance, the, na the richness of nature. Nature is very complicated relation of all bits and pieces and just comes up to something and sometimes it becomes super delightful, sometimes it's scary. And um, so 
we try to see the site and all sorts of elements in the project and try to script those uh, relations to create some kind of richness. And I would like to briefly, a little bit, maybe quickly go through uh, our early projects, which is not like uh, a dwelling as a house, um, uh, but I th uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very important project uh, since we started off from this project. And this project is, the, the client is a windmill company, and uh, why windmill company is that we were a part-time job jobbing <laughs> in this windmill company when we just graduated and the, uh, the CEO of this com company just gave us uh, this small, small project to, to tell us to find your own way of architecture and, uh, and the, it was to build a rest stop in, in the windmill farm, like an arbor, like a, a, a little roof and four pillar to, for people to rest and see the windmills and the scenery and uh, things like that. Since you know, windmills are very new to Japan, he, he wanted to show that the scenery with the windmill of Japanese mountains are not not, um, not bad, well, actually beautiful. So he wanted to make something like uh, some place to, to, to see the, the scenery. And, but when you go to the site, the scene was already beautiful. And actually, it's a windy place since there's uh, the windmill round, rounding. So, um, we needed. We thought we needed a wall instead of a roof, um, and people doesn't go to see the windmill in the rainy days. So we made a structure uh, make with four walls without roof. But uh, and we made and we made the structure deformable and swaying in the wind uh, with a steel structure. So it's like the other elements in the scenery, like the greens and the clouds drifting and uh, the windmill revolving, things like that, to complete the scene. And as you can see that like grasses bend uh, when it's affected by the wind uh, to a C curve. And also, if you put a steel rod, it also bends as a C curve. But once you bundle it, it becomes an S curve. And I thought that was a minimal effect for the steel uh, to be a little bit artificial and new to the scenery. And to efficiently take the load to the steel, uh, we had to uh, create like a gridded, gridded structure. And the bottom is 30 millimeter by 30 millimeter pillar. And as you go to the top, it's, it becomes six by six. Uh, so it's like a fishing rod, like getting narrower and narrower uh, going to the top and bundled. And we calculated and we decided to make the structure deformable to uh, about 30 centimeter uh, with both sides. And they all have bracings in all grids and they have loose holes so uh, usually they're, they're movable, but uh, when the wind gets strong, this locks in, at some point uh, and uh, uh, 
it avoids collapsing. And the structure is sandwiched uh, with rubber sponge-like material to deform with the structure. And it acts as like a sail on a boat uh, to take the load to, to the steel frame. And also absorbs uh, the small sound and the faint vibration during the deformation. So this is from the inside. And we put a little uh, tall chair inside uh, to see the deformation more, uh, because when you go as you go up, you see more deformation. So we kind of uh, excluded uh, the chair a little bit long. And you can see that the size is very small, two by two. Uh, it's two meter by two meter. So it was a structure to plan the whole scenery uh, for us. It's with the windmills and the, the scenery. And this project was done a while ago, and, uh, and it's unbuilt. And, but it shows how we think and decide. Uh, it's, it, I think this project quite the quite clear using uh, to, to express our way of thinking. Now the site is in Nemuro. It's, this is Hokkaido. This is the mainland of Japan. This is Hokkaido, and the site is somewhere around here. The, this whole land was owned by the owner uh, of the windmill company, and he was actually born here, and he had plenty of land, and he wanted to give that kind of back to the people who live around here, like to use it as a park or somewhere that can, that, well, what, what people can come in. And this is me. So it's quite huge. And um, it's the, the site was uh, spreading horizon with this uh, short bamboo all around where trees can't grow because the wind here is very strong. So no forest can survive here. And, um, and the north wind from the sea and the corrosion from, of the warm and cold uh, current generates sea fog during the summer, the most of the summer. And because of that, uh, the daylight hours are so few in this uh, region and the average temperature becomes very low. So the, the climate becomes like a high mountain and uh, all the, the greens are actually uh, uh, are the plants that you can see in the high mountains. And so, like I said, the client request was to make this huge place as a park so people can, uh, people around can come inside, and, but the budget was very low so for this you know, site size. So we had to plan something really effective uh, to, to completely change or uh, change a slight but important thing in this site. And so we proposed just two walls that snuggle up in the wind-beaten, shadowless field uh, to one of the cliff edge and to simply provide um, as a, a simply provide a, a shadow uh, so that people can easily maybe go 
to the cliff, uh, to, to the edge, because um, it's quite scary if you kind of face this enormous, huge scale of landscape. So we wanted to give a point where people can kind of rely on it. And trees and plants grow, and maybe butterflies stop over. We imagined something like that in between these two walls. Uh, sky, horizon, gra grass, small forest. Um, we hope to, um, we hope those things will be grown in between these spaces and mixed together with the, the, the surrounding environment. And the shape of the wall is the base is a uh, parabolic curve and as you go to the top you get straighter. So from one side uh, the wind you can they, they avoid uh, they can uh, gently take the wind to the side. But on the other hand, the wall takes in the wind load, so it falls down. So these two walls are actually helping each other uh, and supporting each other to exist in this space, in this place. And the wall is made from a nine millimeter single steel plate, very thin, and it's six meter by six meter. So, and we plan to use heating and cooling technique to bend the plate very accurate, like you make uh, a big ship. And these small bends are open to work as a stabilizer because when we calculated the wind, uh, th this, um, this wind makes uh, a horizontal lift force, uh, just like an like a airplane wing. Uh, airplane goes up because of the, the difference of the length of the, the side of the wing. So uh, the same thing, same thing occurs here. So the base is very close to the foundation, so it, 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 it's not it, it's strong enough, but to the top it's very uh, it vibrates like uh, 100 millimeters, so we had to break down all the wings to to avoid lift force. And the wind goes faster outside, and inside it gently circles around and disappears in the center. And the lights come in uh, from these uh, ribs to, to lighten up inside a little bit. So we, we thought, we, we, we tried to connect small, small things into, and, and another thing we, we, we gave to this site, uh, which is wall. And uh, we kind of tried to script the situation to make a situation that it wasn't, that couldn't happen here. And we think that the taking balance and design relations to um, eventually humans and other factors come together will actually lead to a situation that we call richness. And then now I think trees were probably possible to grow here, which had never happened. And 
And not only the short bamboo, the other one that was hiding in the shadow will start to grow in these between spaces. And the, and the butterflies maybe inhabit here and And we think that that situation pulls people to the place. And um, I think that kind of indirect designing is what we call kind of natural uh, in a way uh, as a place. And this 2015, um, Arc Asia was uh, held at Ayutthaya in 2015, and we did a design research and we presented um, unfolding elements. And it was to, uh, the theme was future of the past, and it was to present your own country's uh, alternative uh, from going back to the history. And uh, we were looking in the architectural, Japanese architectural textbooks and uh, history books, uh, but we were not very interested in the buildings itself. We were actually we got interested in one sentence that said, uh, before the foreigners came in, before the foreigners and the Buddhism came into to the island in, in Japan, um, there was no shrine in the shrine. And that means there was no building, in, uh, uh, there was no shrine as a building in the shrine. And that one sentence uh, strike, strike us and, uh, and we kind of dug that a little bit and went to research to see the actual, um, what, was, what was before uh, the, the shrine building. And, uh, we, and we, we, came, we, and we found out that uh, there was a notion called an animism is to worship the nature. The gods are not one. The, their, their gods are everywhere, in rocks, trees, river, etc. And we were very interested in Iwakura belief, which is mainly rocks. And um, there's a, there are all sorts of rocks many, many in Japan, and um, they're made of uh, rock and w one single rope, and usually there's like a small shrine, but it's like this size, so it's just for praying, and uh, it's like just a sign that there's, um, there's a god here with, together with this rope. And we found out that in here it looks very like a similar size scale rocks, but uh, we found out that there are many scales of rocks and uh, many functions of Iwakura uh, to the city and to the, to the place. And uh, I want to introduce a few of it, and, uh, which is pretty different in scale. And this is called onigura. It's in Yoshino. It's a very traditional uh, place, a little bit south from Kyoto. And during going to Yoshino, there is a cliff, uh, a bold cliff suddenly appear. And onigura shrine is this. This is the Onigura Shrine. And um, 
it, so it, it's just like a landmark, and uh, it contains metal inside. So this rust coming out of the the rocks kind of gives a contrast with the the surrounding greens, and uh, it makes beautiful scenery. And another one is called Kamikura Shrine. And it's a shrine that can be seen from the city. Well, uh, you can't see in this uh, slide, but there's the city uh, all around here. And it's actually Onigura is around here. So if you go, to, go all the way down to the sea, you have this Kamikura Shrine and the city. So this is Kamikura Shrine. And this is like a, a mark again. Uh, and you can't go inside. And you, you can rest on top of it after you're climbing up this high cliff. And it's very interesting that uh, this city is uh, a very historical uh, steel manufacturing uh, place. And uh, this rock also contains steel. So you know, um, it's very important for living. So that's why it's all also becoming a god, same as Onigra. This shrine is Konochi Shrine. And you can see there are many scenes and many rocks. And this is very interesting because the existing rocks were used for the master plan of the shrine. So this is the gate. And you have like an uh, additional place which rocks are making a small, um, small hole inside. And this is like the main gate. And then this um, shrine is worshiping this um, cliff, which you can't see all. Of. So the existing rocks are used as plan of the, the whole shrine. This is again, it's just a gate to show that we're worshiping this and you can't go inside. So it was the sequence of rocks becoming to, uh, to a shrine. And this Akakura shrine is in the cedar forest. It's relatively small, but the, the human size is this, praying in, the, in this kind of uh, overhang. And um, this Akakura shrine was very interesting to us because this rock was making complete different situation from the surrounding. Because, because of this rock, there's sunlight coming into this cedar forest where these places are shadowed with the, the forest. So um, different trees grow on top of this rock and having this uh, tree, uh, you have leaves falling down in the, uh, in the fall and soils made on the top and water, uh, the, that soil contains water and um, that kind of gives this uh, mold texture to the, to the back of the, to the rock and it's completely changing the surrounding environment with just one object. 
And that special place kind of brings people to gather and dance and pray uh, since it's a special place. So we were fascinated by a strong object creating place than space like shrine, like the, the structure shrine makes. So that was our interest, I think, uh, in the previous project as well, like a strong structure or object making to, to make the, to the whole scenery completely different or into a different direction is what we're interested in. And from here is a little bit about dwelling, uh, still very small project. And this project is just a single wall in front of the house and uh, it's not the main house. And um, after that tower project, um, we have no projects, right? So architects usually go to, I don't know, your parents, and then say, let's build a house. But my parents said, OK, we're enough with the house. <laughs> and I was still living in the, in the house, so I really understood that. But the, the wall made uh, next to the street, which is facing north, was deteriorating with uh, the moist and uh, the time was passed uh, for about maybe, I think it was there for maybe 30 or 40 years. And uh, it was this high. So they wanted to be something more light because of the earthquake. They are worried about the earthquake. And uh, also the moist that's being kept inside this gap with this concrete wall in, and uh, becoming dead space, very little dirty place. And uh, also the property is very precious in Japan, in Tokyo. So they, my mother really loves gardening, so she wants to, be, uh, she wants to use as a little garden, uh, even in this 1.3 meter gap. So, we, okay, so we, we will do the wall, okay. Then um, we started off by kind of doubting that this can be architecture or is it something what we're interested in or what we, we had nothing to do, so we just did this. And due to the, to the moisture and the security problem, uh, like, if you put a very opaque wall, if you go inside, no one can see from outside. So it's sometimes not secure. So they wanted something that's, that can be seen, but that's also not been seen. So we had to make a very um, transparent but opaque at the same time boundary. And we chose expanded metal. Uh, for the main material, uh, and I like this material because it's made from a small steel metal sheet and cut, and by stretching it, it becomes like this size. So the, the so the existence of the the material is very, very uh, weak and uh, in a positive way, I think. And uh, so we chose this material. And since it's in the north side and, and we wanted the, the lights coming, small lights also coming in and reflection coming into the site to make the greenery better, uh, we wanted to make the, the wall without using frames or pillars. So we bended the expanded metal big along the site but it's still weak. So we bend it at the corner to make a pillar-like structure and 
intermediate pillar like structure uh, to make uh, the wall stronger. So this is what we made. And we put a stainless mesh curtain uh, for the gates. And there's another gate here, actually, a bigger <laughs> one. And we opened some windows so the wind can go through. Also, this material uh, has, uh, can, can flow the wind, but uh, can flow the air. But uh, we wanted the wind to come in also. So we, and we opened some openings. So this boundary can be reread according to the situation of the surroundings and what comes up together with the scenery, like continuous with the street or continuous of con the living room. And um, it can be from the other side. The, the street can be wider. Um, so it's something that's very flexible in a way. And, and it works as a lace curtain like uh, function. So in the daytime, even if you open up the, the window full, uh, no one can see inside clearly. So this project actually was very uh, thoughtful for us. Uh, because architects intend to change cities or urban situation by designing houses. But that kind of makes um, the privacy sometimes uh, not enough, because they want connections and uh, they want uh, relations. So we use glasses and make it transparent. But uh, privacy and heat problem also is uh, is not good. So uh, the answer to the city actually makes other problems. So we so we don't want to do that. We want to make all balanced. And we thought that it's very effective to just design a wall instead of a house, no, instead of a whole house. Because it's actually the boundary of the private and uh, public. And uh, it's actually faster to change the whole city with just designing the wall. And actually make the condition better for the house, too. Uh, this project is a conversion of an apartment to a single house or a weekend house. And in the day, in the weekdays, they're lended to uh, like magazines to, to shoot for the magazines. Uh, so it's like a background, like a photo studio. And they earn money from that. And then they use to upgrade furniture and uh, things like that. So because weekend houses are not used in the weekdays. Uh, so it was like some kind of a, like a business, a new way of uh, creating something very uh, individual uh, so that it and also uh, can be used as a business. And the client uh, did it with first with his own house. And the building is a two-story RC structure. And this project was started, uh, we were asked to do the interior design. And, uh, but in the first meeting, he came with tons of Google images and uh, books and things. So, and we thought that um, it was pretty clear that what he wanted. Uh, it wasn't something that's like bad taste or something. And we can't say that that's bad taste or 
you know, it's his. So, um, but if we do it, if we, or maybe we could fight with the client, but we didn't choose that because uh, um, we're not interested to create something we want. We're, we're more lazy about those things. So um, we were hearing and showed many things. That, but there were two critical things that client probably can't solve was the, the relation. He, he had a parking lot on the south side of the, 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 the plot, but uh, um, it's always shadowed with the adjacent housings. And he wanted that place full of green. And also he wanted this window to be renewed to have new connection between the building side and the garden side. And also this rooftop uses, uh, uses something. And we thought that we can propose that uh, instead of the interior design. So, so we demolished the existing, this balconies and eaves, and uh, we got rid of it, the, the windows, sashes, and shutters. And we tried to design the, the boundary. Uh, and, uh, and just, we gave, we, we gave a window to, in between the garden side and the building side. So it looks like a three-story, but the, it's actually the, the structure is still here. So the window is actually bigger than the building. And we have basically three functions to this window. First one was is the uh, the handrail for the second floor. Uh, he wanted a new connection, an open connection to the to the green uh, garden, but uh, it always ends up with designing handrail. So we integrated as an important element uh, from the beginning to the window. So we use this handrail to split the doors and upper and the down. So uh, it used this handrail is working as a, as a railing of the door as well. And the second is the reflection that this huge glass makes to lighten up the, the shadowed garden. And um, it's very interesting that when glasses get thinner and thinner, the, the reflection percentage gets uh, higher and higher. So it was good to know that because uh, we had to make the, the door light and uh, so the people can easily move. It's all movable. So, uh, so we had to make this with thin glass and thin steel. And it ended up about maybe 150 kilograms per door. And it's like moving one liter bottle on a, on a table to the side. Uh, so it's very light. And the third is the heating uh, chimney effect that we uh, made with this really thin, like, atrium. Uh, it, so the heat uh, goes up to the rooftop uh, before it reaches the building structure. And so we needed the door to be light. And uh, so we calculated this balance. And uh, we also calculated the deformation of this uh, door during typhoon season. 
so we ended up uh, this door can be deformed for uh, 10 centimeters towards this side. So you can bend like this for 10 centimeter uh, without all the glasses or anything, uh, or the, the doors getting off the rail uh, in, the, in the very windy situation. Uh, so it's, it's like a very, uh, it's not very hard maybe window. It, it kind, it's kind of like a, it's like a membrane kind of st structure window. And this is the reflection we have. So this garden is quite artificial because the shadow, uh, we have it uh, to the opposite way. Uh, because this side is the south, the sun is here, so um, it's very artificial garden. And you can see that every element is uh, not fitting into the right place as it was, like uh, it's all shifting, uh, even the curtains are also shifting to the outside, so it's very wide opened. Uh, boundary. And even when it's closed, it's shifted from the building for, for about 250 millimeters. So it's very, old, it's very wide and very uh, open situation. And this is the second floor. Uh, this is the rail and the handrail that we were talking about. When you open it, it becomes like a, a terrace, and uh, the only thing that's left is the handrail we just need, just the armrest. And this is the rooftop. And we also was kind of uh, thinking about scale of the living and uh, the interior scale and the outside uh, exterior scale. It's making, th this window is actually making two scales, I think. One is cropped scale from the interior with small grids that's very natural in the interior. But outside, uh, usually the housings have the, the, the facade uh, with the windows and things coming from uh, exposed of the interior planning. But for, for this one, it's more of a scale. It has a scale of a, of a public scale. So uh, the garden is very like uh, extraordinary. Uh, like right scale with the greens and trees. And we're running out of time, so I'm going quick. And this is called Living Pool. It's another renovation. Is this house to be renovated? The the owner loved the the surrounding and uh, he chose to move to this house. It's a very old house. And in the first meeting, he brought this model to me. And he said he wants to live like this. And OK, we said OK. And um, it was reasonable. We tried many plans, uh, but he was trying to avoid taking off pillars and things. So it was very polite to the structure. and. Uh, the variations we made was actually not polite. So we thought we give we give this plan to to the new to the renewed house, and um, but instead of that we looked into the foundation, which was very dirty. And it, if the the upper house is clean, but if you have like a dirty foundation, I thought it was really a pity. So uh, we thought we should um, refresh this and 
also anti earthquake uh, we, we had to strengthen the uh, the foundation so we focused on the foundation instead of the upper floor uh, upper house and we added this concrete slab and initial uh, and uh, rise to the initial height and he wanted so it's like the the boundary window i think it, the the owner actually knows what he wants and uh we can be someone who can advise them but uh it's it's sometimes a bit hard to be uh to propose them uh an idea or something uh because um I think that's not what they are looking for. Uh, actually, they're looking for something else. And for this one, they were looking for an idea to live with the surroundings and have a lighter environment to live uh, instead of the previous dark house. So we focused there. So we just added this concrete slab bowl and insulated, and uh, and we put a uh, heating uh, pipes inside. So in the winter time, it becomes a warm bowl, and in the summer, it keeps the the cool air inside the bowl. And since the existed uh, previous floor was here and changed lower down to almost the ground level, the the reaching of the sunlight. Uh, extended deeper, and also the scene scenery uh, was like looking horizontal before, but now it's looking up to the mountains. So you feel more uh, sky from uh, the inside the house. So it, it's uh, it's more close to having uh, a situation like outside. And we separated the foundation and the housing with this uh, long ringed um, baseboard. all around in one ring to make the housing territory, uh, which is like put on top of the foundation. And also reflection from the other side comes from down from down of the, the corridor to lighten up the whole space. And this is the, the gate existing uh, entrance, but we, we left that as an entrance to kind of feel you're going inside the house. Uh, but neighbors uh, come to the window and uh, gives vegetables uh, directly to the kitchen. So it's, uh, it's very, we designed very uh, explicit boundary, but uh, it was uh, actually connecting th with the surroundings. So he lives in the foundation. And um, yeah. And one other thing that he was proposing at the first uh, to lighten up the house and to see the scenery, he, he wanted to open ceiling windows and uh, more windows to the side walls, but uh, he, that's what he proposed, but it, it will make maybe water drops from the ceiling window and also privacy, and this is in the countryside, so it snows in the winter, so the heating problem will probably occur. So um, 
that's the point where we kind of proposed and we gave idea to it to just just designed just designed this foundation not changing the the opening of the house so we changed the order of the design uh, site to house and then setting up foundation to site then they have the place to stay or to live uh, uh, which is foundation and house to uh, uh, that functions uh, like a to like toilets and bathroom so we no we renovated the the order of how the the place is made and these kind of little small elements are usually overlooked in making totality in architecture. And, um, but I think making these small elements and actually designing very briefly to, uh, to these uh, in-between relations, I think it can actually cross border uh, with even making a very explicit boundary, uh, not making transparent housings, uh, making well, that produces another problem. So um, we're very in, uh, into those kind of overlooked elements. And this one is called uh, initiative roof. Uh, I don't know why we called. Um, I, I think I wanted to kind of propose uh, something that was like there before the house. So this is also on the renovation project. And the main house was built 45 years ago and uh, they wanted another room to, for storage so they added uh, another small room uh, later on, maybe 10 years later, or, and it was to renovate this house. And it's, it's actually re relatively big as a Japanese uh, Tokyo house. And um, we went to the site and we saw the house and it was very enough uh, it's it's uh, 45 years ago. It was the land is big, so the housing was also big. So it was actually big enough, and uh, rooms were numbers were enough. So um, the, we even actually had an uh, you know uh, extra room outside. So, but the client wanted something else. Um, the client wanted to add some kind of green room or like a glass room to to the to the to the garden, and uh, to have this separated land to gather uh, into one again. So I think that's what they imagined with this greenhouse. But having greenhouse at the south side will make the moist and when they're gone for work um, you know the the heating of that glass makes into the house will kind of destroy the house uh, I, I think the reason of this old house was maintained uh, very nice was uh, because of the land and uh, the and actually the size of the land um, which makes the 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 air circulation well so everything was very um useful us usable and but adding that glass house i think will destroy those kind of uh balanced situation so we propose to make an outside corridor to connect the separated room. 
and also the second floor bedroom and balcony to be connected to the garden as well. So this time it was a, it was a challenge for us. Uh, for boundary window and living pool, it was an element that functions actually to the building, uh, an important role for the building. But this time it was really enough. Uh, the house, house was big enough and it had big enough window. The land was big. So we had to propose something without function. And I thought that was a very challenging thing and what we have to do because uh, that's what I think architecture can do. And uh, people say when they look at this, first when they look at this, people say, is this really needed? But um, once you go to the site, they say, oh, it's reasonable. So I think, but feeling that is like kind of, uh, uh, they feel this comfort unexpectedly. And that means it's, I think it's new for them. So. I think that's a possibility that architecture can do. So um, we stick to make structure that has no function. So it completes its structure by itself. And uh, I'll explain that later. So it's like an extending a small element from the inside to outside. It's just a staircase you can see and a pillar that kind of ends at the window. And this is from the additional small room. It's a study room. And this is from the second floor terrace. And you kind of feel the, the surrounding like houses and like scenery of the, the tall apartment as like your garden uh, at the same time together with these trees in your garden. This is, so it's like a very simple frame that, that reflects also the surroundings. It's painted 100% reflective paint. And the length is 17 meters, and the height is about 5.5 meters. And it has four pillars with one bracing that works as a staircase for people. And to, to make the water drop down to, to, the, to the ground, we made this uh, roof uh, pulling with the, this drain, drainage chain. Uh, we pull it, that, so this is a weight, it's like uh, 100 kilograms, and uh, we pull the chain to make the water slope uh, so that the water can drop to the chain. And we did that to the other side as well, uh, to, the cor to the different corner. So this is the scale. And uh, the staircase brace as also works as uh, collapsing to this way, because it's a very umbrella-shaped uh, structure that d doesn't define a place like um, surrounding with four pillars. It's just one pillar in the center that creates this side and like this side. And also, this is just bent uh, with its own load. This is 4.5 millimeter steel plate and uh, it's just it's, so it's like a very light slightly bolted uh, shape 
also pulled at the end with this chain. From, so it's a, it's a very flexible, uh, it's a very complicated shape, this uh, roof. And it kind of grabs uh, all the surroundings to, so it makes this garden and surroundings like a element for, as an interior like uh, for, the, for the house, for the living. So you can see it's slightly sloped in this way, and also it's sloped this way. And uh, the previous projects, we were defining the, the scale with, uh, with a more aggressive way. But this time, we tried to scale this thing not to avoid the existings. Uh, so uh, these existing hangovers have function that leads the sunlight uh, shut in the summer, but gives sunlight deep into, into the house on the, in the winter time. And uh, so we didn't want to avoid that. We could maybe extend this hangover, but that will make the winter time very shadowy. So we, that's why we separated the structure uh, outside and made it higher so that it actually creates uh, extra shadow in the summertime so that the, the inside house and the, the garden has connected shadow. And uh, for the winter, uh, is this, this hangover works 100%. And for this side, uh, we thought about uh, having the bedroom uh, light in the wintertime. So if you go a little bit more up, uh, I think this roof will kind of uh, distract the sunlight in, to, in the, in the wintertime to the, to the bedroom. So uh, I think th this was like the maximum scale we can put into this site. And that was like about 2.1 meters from the, the roof of the, the first floor. This is from away from the, the, the site. So it, it, it's one of the elements in the scenery, with, together with surroundings. So, it's, so we kind of made a scale, uh, like a middle scale uh, into the house. Because I think this tree, 45 years ago, it was half size. And uh, it was like this height. So, I think the, the window of the house and the trees were the same size and it's like widespread garden horizontally. But this 45 years, they, they grown up and uh, kind of taking over the, the site. So we kind of gave balance to the site, again, using scale as well. And this is called Northside Villa. We're calling it Northside Villa. It's, a, it's one house, and this is all new, but uh, we're separating uh, the utility spaces and the rooms with a different structure. Um, this is the, the initiative roof uh, plan, but it's very easy to explain, so I will use this. Uh, normally, Japanese housings, uh, they are the 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 utility spaces and staircases, corridors, they are efficiently laid out on the north side. And on the south side, they want uh, the, the maximum sunlight. So they put the living rooms on the south side. And in order to make this bigger, you have to be efficient, like a puzzle, to, uh, for, the, for the north side. And this client was also, uh, he, sh they don't, even know what architects do. And uh, I don't know what they came to our office, but uh, the, the site is very close. I think that's the only reason. And um, the request was to make the living room big. 
And also, it's a housewife, so uh, she wants a very efficient uh, water spaces so that she can work very efficiently during daytime. And, uh, and also, it's very dense. Uh, the housings are very uh, densely uh, built around. Uh, so she, she wanted privacy. Uh, she even don't want to make any window uh, transparent. So that's what normal people say. So I wanted to, and I can understand that really, so I wanted to propose something that can, um, that can create that request more uh, architecturally. So we made this place, uh, we proposed to use this utility spaces to be the depth of the, the living rooms and uh, bedrooms. So that, uh, because they don't want to make many openings to this side. They just wanted a uh, slight light from the south side, uh, just lights. So um, we, we tried to make this uh, place, which is like black box uh, usually in the house, uh, but it's actually one third of the space uh, in the house. So we thought we should open that in some way and use that as a scene for the living room to make a deeper and uh, maximize the, the feeling of the living room to the site size. And that's why we separated to make, so this is the utility space, and this is the room. And also, the budget is like the normal house, so we had to deal with the, the budgets also. So we decided to make the rooms relatively cheap with using uh, industrial material, very like housing maker house, and uh, we focused and put money into the utility spaces so that this room can have good scene. So this is still an ongoing project, so uh, we're not really sure of what we're doing yet. But, uh, but the, the, the concept is like that. Uh, we're very um, interested into those really ordinary living, and we want to propose architectural ideas to ordinary living. So this is the second floor. And this goes up to the rooftop of the, the rooms, and uh, it's a terrace. But you have this huge volume still, but uh, it's cropped with the, with the house in front. So you just have a small hut, like stick at the back. So it's very natural with the scenery uh, from the street side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shinko Masuda, for such a very inspiring presentation. Now it's Q&A sessions. So uh, the staff will hand out a small piece of paper. You can write it down, or you can use microphone in the middle of the aisle, or you can ask the staff some microphone. Okay, please welcome Associate Pro Professor Dr. Ton Khao Panin, the moderator of this session, to be on stage. Thank you for the lecture. I'm glad you showed all those projects. They're all very sensitive and delicate. But I have a confession to make. 
your first half of the lecture made me nervous because I thought that this was going to be an anti-architectural lecture and it's going to be difficult to discuss. Then you showed the, the houses, so that sort of made me relive a little bit. <laughs> so before, um, talk, uh, before asking about uh, any of the projects, I'd like to start with a very general question first because looking at all your projects, it made me curious whether, um, do you think, from the beginning, from the first built project till today, you started your uh, practice in 2007, right? Mm -hmm. so it's been 10 years. Do you think your ideas about architecture or your working direction have changed at all during these past 10 years? Uh, it's becoming just deeper, <laughs> deeper into ourselves, I think. It's, and more honest to... Uh, myself as a as a daily living man mm -hmm. so it's the same so it's sort of the same theme sort of it's sort of re yes interpreting it's very, the same, same yes, questions yes it, i think it's but but the when the project gets bigger and bigger i think uh, it, it it's kind of it gets harder to uh maintain myself maybe mm -hmm. sometimes because it's some like architecture the the figure of kind of architecture is like there and um if we go close to it uh sometimes they kind of invade us but uh <laughs> but that's what's getting hard for us like these days but mm -hmm. still we 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 just take time and uh just find the way to make architecture continuous from the daily living or what I f really feel as an average man. So you see it as a more of a continuous practice, sort of re-asking the question over and over with a different scale of the project, right? Yes. Yeah. All of your projects are different in terms of how we are related to um, living spaces and the environment, but I get the sense that they all have something in common. Do you think you have a common working philosophy or a theory or ideas that run I mean, through all the projects? Do you think there's anything that binds sort of all the projects mm -hmm. together in some way? Well, actually, there are many things that we kind of discuss all the time, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it's, the, I think the most maybe important thing we are very uh, careful about is that, uh, like I showed in the, in the slides, mm -hmm. uh, to would try to make the, the situation or the place itself instead of making space. Mm. Because so, so that's what you call in, indirect design in a way. Right? Yes. Mm. I think giving space is, is very easy sometimes uh, uh, to make a building or mm. to, to, to make some enclosure. So, but to make a situation, I think, is just about how things are related. And uh, I think it's a very structural uh, thing. So. Yeah, I think that's what's we're very, and that actually affects mm. the space and yeah. qualifies the space. So uh, that's what we're careful about, I think. But, but I think that not talking about the space itself sometimes becomes very difficult for us as an architect because space is the first thing that we can, we can grasp, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I have a question about um, your last project. The you call it a north side uh -huh. uh, house or a utility north house side project. Villa, yeah. Yes, in de because in designing a house, we get ar architects are usually focusing first on the living spaces mm -hmm. and then perhaps the style of the house. But you seem to be proposing. You seem to be something doing something completely different. Are you trying to propose a sort of a different definition of dwelling in, in that? house or are you trying well, to make a different statement no. with that house well I think it's uh, very natural to think utility spaces mm -hmm. looking at the history of housings 
because like very traditional farming farmhouses mm -hmm. or like uh, traditional Japanese houses, um, ch the change of the housing plan is actually the change of the utility spaces, the, the specification of the utility spaces. Because the first uh, kitchen was dangerous to be inside the house because it's fire, mm. using fire. So that's, that was outside. And uh, also, it didn't have enough cleanness for the toilet, so that's also outside. And, um, but eventually, they, they came inside. And that kind of changed the whole structure of the housing and also the living. Also, and also, the electric mm -hmm. you know, yeah. furniture has also changed. But uh, the biggest issue that changed housing is, I think, is looking at the history. Is utility spaces and uh, mm -hmm. I think that's what's the dwelling architecture kind of re the, the roots mm -hmm. of the re architecture is there but the uh, architects were are to to build like palace mm -hmm. or you know shrine or something like that so it needs strong main mm -hmm. rooms or you know I think but Housing is, I think, it's different. The, yeah. the, the, looking at history. Yeah, but by focusing on utility spaces, you are actually addressing ways in which um, this living space or a house can be operated, which is, of course, reflected in the plan. But my question is, do you think that this kind of idea can also be reflected in the look of the house also? I think for the look of a house, uh, we maybe didn't make a complete uh, change in the scene, but uh, we made, I think we made some kind of uh, depth to mm -hmm. the city yeah. with the leftover spaces. Uh, we tried to make that big volume mm -hmm. uh, cropped with the room, uh, the, the, with the, the box, and the uh, those leftover part will be glass mm -hmm. and yeah. having light wall at the north side, mm -hmm. which will lighten up the the whole house and um, and that cropped little room mm -hmm. is like a, a small depth to the city, I think, and uh, I think that's I think that was enough. For yeah, us I, to I understand, maybe. but not talking about the look of the house is also difficult. Right, because you, you remember um, Le Corbusier once said that the plan is a generator, but even for Le Corbusier, he had to think at some point about how his houses would look. So my question for you is that, at which point do you begin to think about how the house would actually appear? Or do you discuss about that at all in your office? We discussed that, yeah. and, uh, and we're, we're ending up like this, I think. Yeah. We're, it, it's the way I think we. So, we so you mean that this, this is, is your answer. this is your de decision? It's not yes. accidental. Yeah. It's, it's your. Mm -hmm. Now maybe there there are questions from the floor. Hi, Shingo. Um, well, we've talked a lot about architecture throughout the years. Um, and you've always uh, used the term uh, scripting the richness. And, um, and uh, I appreciate, I mean, I, a lot of your projects is usually about this wild, untamed nature or urbanism. And then you do this one little thing that makes it all rich. Um, my question to you is, when you get larger projects, or you have to d design a total environment, where you almost have to create all the richness yourself, how will you approach that? I, I don't feel to make every richness, I think. It, I just want to make a critical point, I think, to the situation. I think that's what the, the architecture can do and the, the nature can't do, maybe. So I really like the artificial way of like critically changing 
the, the space. But the detail, I, I'm not interested. How they live or something. It's, I'm not into it. <laughs> What, what, about, what about a language? Do you think there are certain languages that are specific to your work? Or, or do, I mean, are all the projects different from one to another? Do, do you think you have certain languages that are specific to your work? I don't know. Do, does it look like? <laughs> it, it doesn't look like that. It, it looks okay. like all the projects deal, deal with different kind of situations. So it oh. differs from one project to another, which is sometimes it's difficult for, for us architects because we feel the need to sort of establish our oh. own identity. Oh, okay. okay. Right? Yeah, so yeah, maybe in, in that way we're not caring about too much about the... The styles. The styles, yes. Well, actually, we're trying to get out of the styles, more critically proposing an idea, mm -hmm. I think is more important. So, but, but you're, all, you're still teaching at Musashino, right? Yes, I'm teaching, yes. How, how, how do you see the teaching is related to your practice? Why, why is it important to, for you to be teaching at the same time as doing your own practice? Oh, well, of course, it's very important to, to say something to, to express myself you know, to, to, to others. I think that's one important thing. And, um, and it's very different in you know, generations because young, young students give me different opinions. And also my mother. I, all, I talk all these ideas and uh, sketches to my mother, my wife, my friends. Uh, outside architecture, and uh, I think students are one of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. are, are there any questions from the floor? It's kind of uh, very impressed me in the way of you change the point of view of ar architect that I quite enjoy to see a lot of dynamic drawing or even the, a lot of project that is like, yeah, architect never thought before, for example, the pool house that you try to open the foundation to look at, right? And then you see that it's such a pity because it's dirty and abandoned. But uh, my question is, I just wonder, do you think it can be applied, this kind of, like uh, using foundation as integration of new system technology, as you mentioned, is winter or the, the, the summer season is very comfort area, right? Mm -hmm. Is it possible and why you don't use it as your prototype for other houses? Mm, because uh, my work is to, I think, because I don't think that's the only way to make the space and uh, um, pe people can maybe use it it, but uh, I, I'm into more finding other solutions as well. And uh, I'm not interested in producing numbers. <laughs> in a way, of you mentioned that you like to create kind of critical point of will rather than recreate the whole thing. So I see it's as potential of a critic in the way of new way of modern houses. Design maybe it's very good in a way, high of big potential, and also just wonder one more of your question uh, of your presentation house is called initiative loop. This one uh, you mentioned about is no function at all, in a way, and uh, the thing is how can you approach to the client to success that project? How to convince? Um, I think the one word I got from the client when it's built, uh, when it was built, was the, the, was the most happy word. And uh, they said that the garden got bigger. <laughs> That's what they felt. And, but, you know, they were like, they, in, in their garden, there's a huge structure built. But, uh, they actually feel the garden bigger, and that's that's very um, 
that was very encouraging me uh, that the architectural design is something that's very separate from function and uh, like housings and functions they, they all go from the the blue sky to to and the daily living is like more about inside the hand and uh, that house was also like that, but it was everything enough settled and but I wanted both to to be there together uh, w with a sky and also something very close to the body and and I think that, that that's what's uh, that was important to propose something that goes back to the sky. Mm. And perhaps, uh, are there any more questions? Perhaps, uh, perhaps a concluding question. Uh, do you remember a few years ago, you came to our school and we were talking about the position of your office. How do you think your office is different from any other um, Japanese architectural practice? And you said that it was very difficult to find that position. So I wonder whether, I mean, today, do you think it's, do, do, do you still think it's difficult or have you found, I mean, that position yet? No, I, I, now I feel that just focusing on work and producing ideas and proposing ideas to and sharing that to the world is the only way to make the position so <laughs> that's great so i think we can conclude this i mean we truly appreciate your project because first of all because of the smallness of it and the second of all because of the sensitivity and i mean most of all because of the question that you're asking i mean despite the, of the smallness, they are all very provocative in the statement that they make. So I think that's important, that's, and that's what we need today. So thank you for coming to thank Bangkok you. again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shingo and um, Associate Professor Dr. Ton Khao. And now I would like to ask uh, Ajahn Ton Khao to give out the um, token of appreciation to our speaker today. This year, the forum, the theme, uh, under the theme, Ban Ban or Reconsidering re Devilling. Within this today, we have very interesting six speakers with us, somehow very provocative and change the land of the will to seeing the, the, the word Ban, right? And then I, we hope you have a different lens or di different point of will to reflect or reconsider the context of home or being at home. Today, our ASA International Forum has come to an end. Now, we would like to ask um, Mr. Nantapon Jangen, the Chairman of Architect Expo 2017, to come up on stage and give us a closing remark. Good evening. Um, the ASA Forum has been organized over 20 years ago. For over 20 years, we have been able to invite leading minds in the architectural world to present their work and ideas to a broader audience, asking them to share not only their knowledge, but also to inspire. This year was no exception. Our distinguished field of guests include in order of presentation, David Schaefer, Studio Meg from Thailand, uh, Kesuke Maeda from Japan, Ajarendan from Sri Lanka, Fabrizio Barossi from Spain, Max Chawitala from Germany, and Shinko Masuda from Japan. Thank you all for coming to Bangkok and becoming part of our proud ASA Forum tradition. 
Um, thank you very much. Um, the subject of this year forum, Ban Ban, Reconsidering the Welling, is something we can all relate to. Our home and a place we always spend most time after all. This is why I believe it is the aspect of architecture we should be particularly concerned about. And I am sure that our guest presentation gave us enough to reconsider the welling. Now I would like to take this opportunity to thank to all as our forum working team members. First, our chairman of ASA Forum, Winyu Adraksa. Jacob Kadorinsky. Kichot Nantasili Vikom. Saviti Paisan Watana. Thank you for um, the nice management of ASA Forum. And uh, I would like to uh, say thank you to our lovely moderator, um, Lashapon Chu Chuai, Chat Pong Chun Rudimon, Kataliya Jilapasat Kun, Ton Kao Panin, Mom Luang Pi Yalada Tawi Palangsi. And uh, very special thanks to uh, our senior advisor, um, Bun Sam Prem Tadai and Chat Pong Chun Rudimon. And for a very nice um, sequence learning today and uh, yesterday, uh, I would like to thank you to um, our um, MC, Master of Ceremony, um, Pachalin Gunat, Hansa Silert Chai Panit, And um, I really thank you to uh, KDC Cruise and Pre Lively for a very nice graphic. I am also very grateful to Bruce Cole, our main sponsor who made us a forum 2017 a reality. Last but not least, I am also happy to see such a large audience and many young faces in it. I hope you have all learned something from our event, which is why I am already looking forward to ASA Forum 2018. Thank you very much and see you again next year. Thank you very much, Mr. Nantokon. And uh, can I please invite all of our speaker, moderators, and ASA committee, also the KDC group, to have a photo in, on the stage, please. Together now, yes, thank you. And, okay. and thank you very much for staying with us and I'll see you again next year. Goodbye. Have a good trip. ขอเชิญอาสาคอมมิตี้ขึ้นด้านบนด้วยนะคะ